thank you very much indeed for um, <clears throat> that introduction. Thank you for inviting me uh, today. I, I excuse the fact that I have a um, post jet lag cold, um, so I hope I can uh, manage without um, too many strepsils over the next uh, 30 or 40 minutes. Um, let me start with um, the fifth prefect under the Emperor Tiberius to Judea. What is truth? Pilate says to the tortured prisoner in front of him. One imagines with a rather world-weary, cynical shrug. One of my best friends in politics, William Walgrave, um, who was guilty, really, of a capital offence. He was an intellectual in politics. Um, William Walgrave got into great trouble by <clears throat> musing about that question and by wondering whether the truth always really mattered in politics. He was giving evidence to a civil service committee when minister for the civil service and was asked about some remarks made by his uh, former colleague in the civil service who was by that stage head of the civil service, Robin Butler. Robin Butler himself had been giving evidence to another select committee and had been asked about whether um, politicians should always um, tell the truth in the House of Commons. And Robin Butler had replied honestly um, that that wasn't always the sensible thing to do and had mused about an occasion when it clearly hadn't been when he, Robin Butler, had been working for Jim Callaghan in the 1970s and Jim Callaghan had denied that the then Labour government had any plans to devalue the pound. And William uh, put up a robust defence for Robin Butler <clears throat> and said, um, of course there were times when uh, you didn't uh, tell the truth. No great story in that, you would think, but one um, imaginative journalist, a man called Peter Oborn, who subsequently wrote a book called Politics and Lying. Uh, Peter Oborn rushed out, um, phoned up the Evening Standard, it was as it was then called, and the front page splash on the front on the Evening Standard was a minister says all right to lie to parliament. Huge fuss <clears throat> for three or four days, during which William um, almost uh, lost his <coughs> job until a degree of sanity was restored. Writing about this uh, incident in his own painfully honest um, <coughs> memoirs, um, uh, a book in which William lacerates uh, himself to an extraordinary <coughs> degree. William muses that perhaps he should have stuck to the sort of thing that Isaiah Berlin might have said. Perhaps he should have taken a more philosophical approach and argued that it was wrong to lie except when it was right to lie. <laughs> which, when you think about it, is probably um, uh, just about um, the right thing to say. <coughs> now, I start with that, which seems Isaiah Berlin, William Woolgrave, um, intelligence. Uh, it's, all that seems a long way from where we are now. Uh, President Putin, President-elect Trump, uh, and the recent Brexit campaign in this country. The first time I met President Putin, <coughs> he was acting premier of the Russian, of Russia, and we were having a European Union Russia summit <coughs> in, uh, um, in Finland. 
and President Yeltsin was supposed to be coming to represent Russia, but at the last moment, as I think happened fairly frequently, such are the apparently bad effects of vodka, um, he, was, um, he was unwell. <coughs> so Mr. Putin came in his place. And on the wires that day, this was before the internet became so ubiquitous, there were reports of huge numbers of casualties in Grozny, in Chechnya. Um, people blown up, 30 or 40 people killed. <coughs> and we sat down to talk to this the new premier, Mr. Putin, and we asked um, if he could tell us what had happened in Chechnya. And Mr. Putin said he, had, he hadn't heard anything from Chechnya, but he, he'd find out about it and come back and talk to us at lunchtime about it. So at lunchtime, we raised the subject again. He said, oh, yes, he said, uh, it was, I think, what you called an own goal. It was um, some Chechen rebels uh, who were um, running an arms bazaar, and some of their um, bombs blew up, and they were killed. By that stage, we all knew, because it was again on the wires, that the Russian army had begun an assault on Grozny, that they had fired rockets and used helicopter gunships. And you can actually, I, I, I traced this back when I was thinking about it the other day, and it was, it was exactly the day that the, that the Russian army began its great assault. So Mr. Putin said all that to us, um, and he must have known that we knew he was lying, but didn't make any difference. Um, what's a lie? It's a very good book about um, President Putin and today's Russia, written rather suitably by a television <coughs> executive who writes about the extent to which President Putin has turned Russian politics into a sort of virtual reality television program. And the book is called Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, which is, I think, uh, pretty much where Russia is, alas, today. When thinking about the truth or lack of it and President-elect Trump's campaign, you're really spoiled for choice. Um, the Americans are very diligent about trying to spot inaccuracies in what people say in election campaigns. And uh, I think it was the man who was um, uh, detailed by the Washington Post to check on the facts in the campaign kept up late night after night and on average picking up about 60 untruths or downright lies in the Trump M campaign, beginning, of course, with the assertion that President Obama wasn't born in the United States, uh, going to some fairly outlandish propositions such as that President Obama was the founder of ISIS, <coughs> the suggestion that crime was soaring in America's inner cities, that all Mexicans are rapists, um, and, and, and so on. Um, and apparently um, uh, no uh, repercussions in the ballot box, or not very many. In our own referendum campaign, we saw some uh, similar examples. Um, the guiding spirit behind the uh, Leave campaign was described the other day by the political correspondent, by the political commentator, whom I read with most enthusiasm normally, as, as being having a much more sensitive notion of what's happening in British politics than anybody else. He described him as a sort of <coughs> electoral genius. What he was actually apparently able to discern was that people didn't care too much about the truth anymore. We had that extraordinary bus touring the country, uh, telling us that uh, if we voted to leave the European Union, well, there'd be 350 million more a week for the National Health Service. Um, ask uh, Boris about that these days, and he'll say, bus? What bus? Um, there were the... Uh, um, 
I heard one the other day. I was on a platform with, with somebody at, at a conference who was a keen Brexiteer. He had the advantage of, while being British, uh, only spending a, a few days every year in Britain because of tax. Um, he was really enthusiastic that we'd now got our country back. Um, he, he announced that one of the main reasons why he'd been in favour of leaving the European Union was we just had to sign up to 72 different laws made in Brussels and Strasbourg, all of which we disagreed with, but none of which we'd had the right to discuss or debate in Parliament. Uh, well, they were laws I hadn't heard of, nor had he actually, but <coughs> he'd read it on the internet somewhere. Um, it, it, it's called, I think, truthiness. That um, whatever you say must be true because you've said it. Because it corresponds with what you think should be true. And when challenged by experts, quote unquote, that um, this might not be absolutely uh, um, the truth, um, when challenged that this might be in Alan Clark's immortal words, economizing with la verite, um, what do you do? Well, you do what Michael Gove, a distinguished product of this university, um, says. You say, well, who believes experts anymore? Um, an, an astonishing uh, a remark, but and one I didn't, don't, don't imagine he learned when being taught by Francis Lannan. Uh, of course, the truth is always a potential casualty in democratic politics and almost always an absent friend in authoritarian political systems. In, in democratic politics, in most of our post-war democracies, welfare democracies, um, usually um, the lies or semi-mendacities <coughs> have been about the balance between left and right, between your views on the state and your views on the role of the individual, about your views on how much the state is spending, how much it's taxing. And we're all, most of us, sophisticated enough to recognize the weasel words when they come um, trotting around the track. We have no plans to increase VAT. We'll increase VAT, but we have no plans at the moment to do so. Uh, we've, uh, all of us, if we're honest, who've been in democratic politics, have uh, <clears throat> played our part in some of these um, uh, debates which weren't, uh, didn't entirely stand up to um, the truth test, though they were slightly nearer the truth than truthiness. And, and spin doctors have played a part in uh, those sort of discussions as well. I think there were two really um, important spin doctors in my time. Uh, a lot of people want to be thought of as being uh, important uh, actors, but I think the only two who really mattered were, first of all, Bernard Ingham, who was um, Margaret Thatcher's spin doctor. <clears throat> There's a, a remarkably good account in Charles Moore's second volume of the biography of Margaret Thatcher uh, of the so-called Westland helicopter affair, um, which uh, almost brought down um, Mrs. That Lady Thatcher. And you read that, and it's really a, an account of a spin doctor and one very senior civil servant now, a knight of the realm, telling huge porkies and almost destroying the career of a very fine civil servant in the process. The other um, civil servant uh, spin doctor genius was Alistair Campbell, 
um, who uh, was the sort of um, uh, more visible end of the operations of somebody called the Prince of Darkness, Peter Peter Mandelson, who I've never thought was um, um, either as bad as the tabloids suggested or as clever as he suggested. Um, <laughs> Uh, but but, but a, pr a pretty good minister for all that, a very good business secretary and rather a good European commissioner. Um, but I think a slightly inflated reputation for his ability to pull strings. But I am, um, <clears throat> perhaps you can forgive me, um, vanity came knocking on the door at this point when I was thinking of what to say. Perhaps you can forgive me for telling a story about, about the impact of spin uh, on my own life. Um, just before I left Hong Kong, um, a very good television journalist who'd be making some television programs about me and about Hong Kong, Jonathan Dimbleby, produced um, a book about me called The Last Governor. Um, I'm asked to sign it, copies of it, all too frequently. Um, and do occasionally have to remind people I'm actually helping somebody else's royalties, not my own. <laughs> <clears throat> um, the last governor contained a lot of criticisms uh, of uh, um, the Foreign Office, particularly how the Foreign Office had behaved during the 1980s when it had, how can I put this politely, connived at demonstrating that the people in Hong Kong didn't actually want more direct democracy. The book came out, uh, the Foreign Office were horrified and uh, assumed that all this had been leaked by me to Jonathan Dimbleby. Actually, Jonathan Dimbleby had just spoken to a lot of um, members of the Foreign Service who had been appalled themselves by what had happened. But one or two people in the Foreign Office um, one or two former members of the Foreign Office in particular were very cross about all this, and there was a good deal of consternation. Well, a couple of months after I'd left Hong Kong, um, Robin Cook <coughs> got into d difficulties over his marriage and his <coughs> extramarital activities. And uh, on a Saturday... Um, at Heathrow, in, I can't remember which terminal, was um, obliged to decide whether to um, stay with his wife or go off with his um, girlfriend. Um, chose his, his girlfriend, but Alastair Campbell had made it clear that um, the choice had to be made there and then in order to save the government and save his career. So the Sunday papers had a fantastic story to report. And the task for Campbell and Mandelson was to find something else to put on the front page. So they came up with two stories. The first was that the government were going to save Britannia, the royal yacht. And one or two papers ran with that story. The other story, which was... Um, uh, I think pushed into the Sunday Times, was that, the, was that the last governor of Hong Kong was going to be prosecuted for breach of the Official Secrets Act. Um, so the Tower of London beckoned. And this was all based on the Dimbleby book. Now, I, I knew that uh, it wasn't true, but it didn't make the thing particularly comfortable and it didn't make it the next few weeks particularly comfortable for my family. Um, we were in our house in France at the time and every hedgerow, every ditch around the house um, was home to photographers, paparazzi, journalists hoping for the last picture before I was carted off to the Tower of London. Thanks to one good, brave journalist, John Sopel, who's now the BBC's editor in the United States, I think. Um, the story was tracked down. It was shown to be 
um, a try on by um, Mandelson um, and Campbell. Um, it was a uh, shot full of holes and uh, the um, caravan moved on. In November, the uh, government answered a question in the House of Lords saying that it wasn't in the public interest to take any more action about this particular matter. Three or four months later, the government asked me to chair the committee which reorganised the security services um, and the police in Northern Ireland. Just the sort of thing you'd give to somebody who'd been about to be put inside for breaching the Official Secrets Act. So that was my experience of the genius of um, spin doctors. I had been convenient cover for Mr. Cook's marital difficulties one Sunday morning. But fortunately, thanks to a brave and good journalist who risked, I imagine, not least at the BBC, the ire of uh, Mandelson and Campbell for having sniffed out uh, the story. Um, um, the whole of this is written up in a book suitably enough by Peter Oborn, um, uh, who uh, uh, quite properly makes John Sopel the hero of the story. So good journalism is enormously important in exposing mendacity in politics, but it's not always very easy since there are fewer and fewer newspapers which are actually um, prepared to publish that sort of journalism or employ those sort of journalists. One reason, in my prejudiced view, why the BBC is so important um, is because a public service broadcaster should and does um, that sort of uh, uh, good journalism. Though I'm not sure that that was <coughs> always present in the BBC's obsession with a sort of balance um, during the referendum campaign. So we come on to the truth and that uh, referendum campaign. I think on the side of the uh, levers, there were exagger there were exaggerations and precisions which were not very sensible. And I think there was a lack of vision in the way the arguments were presented. Truth was, though, that all the experts, um, uh, much criticised, as I said, by Mr Gove, all the experts agreed that there was a large price in leaving the European Union. And day by day, we're starting to see that now. Um, I can't think of any reputable economists, well, Patrick Minford at the University of Cardiff, who gave us monetarism in its um, most Stone Age form in the early 1980s, thus helping to um, cut a swathe through British industry. Um, I, I can't think of many respectable uh, groups of economists who thought other than that the leaving the European Union was going to be extremely costly. But maybe it was, it was wrong to be quite so precise. But there's a world of difference between that and what was happening on the Brexit side, the 350 million, the taking back control, the arguments about legislation, and the arguments about our borders and Turks. You remember the um, Farage poster with the picture of the stream of refugees uh, and the assertion that we were at breaking point uh, and that um, uh, if we didn't vote to leave the European Union, all those Turks, 70 million of them, would be sooner rather than later um, using our National Health Service uh, and uh, consuming our public services. Now, 
you can catch people out with those sort of lies. But how much does it matter, given the tabloidization of news um, and what the newspapers, or many of them, are saying day after day? <clears throat> I say straight away that I'm in favor of a free press. I think a free press is a very good way of um, ensuring that you, have a <clears throat> you don't have much corruption in society, that you should have better government if you have a free press. I appeared in front of uh, um, the Leveson Inquiry and argued against regulation um, by the state uh, of the press. By and large, um, the more I think about it, the more I find myself agreeing with Tom Stoppard. I'm hugely in favor of um, freedom of speech. It's just newspapers I don't like. <laughs> um, because we do see, I'm afraid, um, an extraordinarily hysterical um, tabloid press um, becoming more hysterical as the business model of newspapers becomes more debatable, as fewer people actually read um, her papers. And when you looked at the, um, I, I, I looked at some of the headlines in uh, probably our leading, well, um, one of our most effective, we put it differently, um, uh, tabloids just before the referendum. It was a newspaper which had a certain reputation for these things in the 1930s. Um, hurrah for the black shirts, as Lord Rothermere once said. Here's a selection of uh, front page leads. Migrants spark housing crisis. Britain's wide open borders. Deadly cost of our open borders. Britain's broken borders. How many more can we take? And so on and so on. But I think that's only the latest example of something which worries me. I worry about the um, attacks uh, in the mostly tabloids, but not just the tabloids, on our whole um, democratic process, which has um, led to, I think, um, many people maybe a majority, thinking that our whole political class is corrupt, that people are only in it for themselves. Now, it is true that there are occasional examples of corruption. It is true that everybody, for some time, connived at a system in which we paid our MPs too little, but winked and nudged at the fact that they could make up for inadequate pay by claiming um, large expenses for all sorts of odd things. But you look at what our MPs are paid or the allowances they can claim, and you look at what happens in almost every other European country or the United States, and you do pinch yourself about whether um, they're really as, as bad as they're claimed to be. <clears throat> and I always remember, it's one of the reasons for thinking that the Washington Post then and Catherine Graham um, were so remarkable. I remember what Catherine Graham said during the height of um, the uh, Nixon scandals and Watergate, when she was co endlessly counselling the paper, as was its editor, against um, assuming that every bad thing about Nixon must be true because they didn't like Nixon. Um, she warned against, and I quote, the Washington Post succumbing to the romantic tendency for the press to picture itself in the role of a heroic and beleaguered champion defending all virtues against overwhelming odds. She was right. Now the um, 
attack has moved on from all politicians are corrupt. The attack has moved on to attacks on the courts and our judges. Now, the um, judges that used to be attacked were the faceless bureaucrats in Brussels or in the court in Strasbourg. But now, now that we've taken back control, it's our judges who get it in the neck. Um, and get it in the neck partly because of the bias shown um, by their backgrounds uh, and uh, interests. The enemies of the people, including the Lord Chief Justice and the Master of the Rolls, uh, were attacked for a finding which actually asserted, asserted the sovereignty of Parliament, which I thought this was all about. They were attacked in one case because the Master of the Rolls is not only a fencer, but openly gay. So presumably it would have been much better if he'd played rackets and been secretly gay. That would have been, <laughs> <laughs> that would have been okay. Now, now the Supreme Court is about to uh, opine on uh, the uh, views of the lower court, distinguished though the lower court was, and Lord Mance, the high steward of this university, who's a member of the Supreme Court, has been attacked again in this tabloid, has been attacked because he knows so many foreign languages. <laughs> Can you imagine anything worse uh, than knowing European languages? <laughs> I, I, I do think that um, the challenge, however, is starting to run deeper because um, if it's not the papers, where else is it that people are getting their information from? It's the social media. Um, and uh, there are, I think, um, consequences of the growth and the development of the social media. And I'll, I'll be um, very brief in dealing with this. Um, I'm hoping to write about it sometime, but I won't... Uh, tell you all the things I've been writing. The point is simply this, that of course the social media um, can help, um, <laughs> I don't think that's me, well, it might be me, it's Paul Dacre, don't worry. Um, of, co of course the, the, the social media um, links people um, a, a, across the world of course, it opens up for them uh, many sources of information which um, they might not have otherwise uh, been aware of. But it is also, I think, responsible for um, uh, linking people, people's um, excessive sense of a particular aspect of their own identity um, with those who share that sense of their own identity. They exchange ideas, uh, information, truthiness, a sense of victimhood. Uh, they exchange a share of a story which is so often totally untrue. And what do these victims do? If we're lucky, um, they vote for taking back control or for Mr. Trump. If we're unlucky, they go off and join ISIS. If we're very unlucky, they go out and buy a gun and shoot up a classroom of kids. And I do think we need to be much more aware of the dangers of uh, that world of sound bites and factoids um, uh, spread by tablets and e-papers and Fox and Twitter um, with the exaggeration of worries, with the manufacture 
of saloon bar factoids, which are simply untrue. Um, what they've done, these uh, examples of the social media, what they've done is to destroy any market for what the world is actually like. On the one hand, on the other. It's a world entirely of black and white, and grey isn't allowed to uh, exist. Gossip, rumour, victims, revenge. So what's to be done? Well, politicians, I'm sorry, this is an old man and an ex-politician speaking. The last campaign I fought was for to become chancellor of this university, and I didn't need to lie. Um, and I don't ever have to do it again, because the only thing that will remove me is the almighty. Uh, I do think that our political class needs to be much braver, much bolder in taking on the tabloids and speaking out against uh, the extent to which they have distorted what the world is like. Why don't more politicians take on Mr. Farage um, and uh, his like? Why don't, why when the Daily Mail ran that enemies of the people, not just the Lord Chancellor took days to work out that she might have some responsibility for the independence of the judiciary and the rule of law. You don't have, you don't have to be a lawyer, which she isn't, um, to know that uh, that's actually one of the responsibilities of the Lord Chancellor. But why didn't the Prime Minister say something about the uh, appalling behaviour of the newspaper? Why, when... I don't think it'll happen now, but why, when Mr. Farage said he was going to lead a march of 100,000 people on the Supreme Court the day they started the hearings on the appeal to them, why didn't the Prime Minister and ministers say this was an absolute scandal and a disgrace? And more important than the ballot box, is the rule of law in any democracy. So I think we need to be bolder in the political class in arguing for these things. And there are some politicians whom I particularly commend, like Dominic Grieve, the former um, Attorney General, who is uh, um, always prepared to speak up for liberty and pluralism. Secondly, there's a really important role for civil society in pursuing what's what we can see on the internet, in pursuing what we have to read about in tabloids. And I think civil society has to be more outspoken as well. And I think the churches have to be more outspoken. It's a fact that in the United States, the majority of Catholics voted for Trump. Now, I'm aware of some of the hierarchy in the United States speaking out about the cult so-called culture wars. And I know that some, including the uh, Archbishop of Indianapolis, now New Jersey, now, now Newark, speaking out on immigration, and others did as well, like uh, I think Cardinal Kupich, but on the whole, uh, I don't think the church was as present in that argument and that debate as why we one might have thought it should be, given uh, the fact that, I assume, people still read St. Matthew's Gospel and the Sermon on the Mount. So I think there's a really important role for the churches, I think there's an important role for civil society. I was very pleased that um, 
yesterday the Archbishop of Canterbury um, had a debate uh, in the House of Lords on British values, um, which we might remember from time to time and even practice uh, irregularly. Um, I'm sorry to sound so depressing, but um, I began with um, John's Gospel. And I'm going to end with St. Augustine, um, who wrote, I think, in an essay on lying. When regard for truth has been broken down or even slightly weakened, all things will remain doubtful. And it's true. Democracy depends. The rule of law depends. Freedom depends on usually telling the truth and usually um, refusing to condone those who lie and lie deliberately. Uh, and I think that um, you forget that and you're on an exceptionally slippery slope and apologies for ending with what Ernie Bevin called a clitch. Thank you.